Hey there everybody, it's Ryan from Cataclysm Now, and tonight we will be doing the conclusion uh, to the Battle of Gettysburg from Clash of Giants Civil War. Um, the morning of July 3rd, uh, 1863, and the Confederates are close-ish to victory. Um, they currently have uh, 33 points out of a total of 41 they'll need for um, automatic victory. And then the Union forces uh, currently have uh, 20... Let's see... 29 out of the 47 they'll need, so... They're down about 18 points. The um, Confederates are only down uh, eight points. So it's very much in the Confederates' favorite right now. But uh, the bad news is that, uh, historic, as it was historically, most of the Union Corps are entrenched along um, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and Cemetery Ridge. Um, Johnson and Rhodes had a bit of success here uh, in the east. Uh, pushing back and battering um, a lot of the Ninth Corps, um, which uh, had to pull back into reserve. Uh, and then the uh, Sixth Corps here has been brought up. Uh, the bad news about them being brought up from reserve is that uh, any casualties taken on them are double points, because um, historically they were used in reserve. Um, but uh, Meade is gambling that Johnson and Rhodes won't be um, too much more effective. Going forward, uh, here we've got Early that's been um, essentially demolished. Uh, Gordon's the only brigade left. Uh, but the real resolution of the battle will rest on what happens here on the southern flank. Um, maybe a kind of a semi-repeat of what happened historically on the second day, but um, Lee will most likely swing to the south and try to attack um, the First Corps, which have been the heroes of the first and the second day. Um, weather a lot of abuse, but they've been positioned on the southern flank here uh, to prevent uh, the Confederates from circumventing the line. And then at some point, um, Longstreet has a um, special command marker for um, launching what is essentially Pickett's Charge. It doesn't have to be used specifically in that sense, but um, three divisions are activated within a certain radius and they can all move and attack. Uh, their chits are then pulled out of the cup for the rest of the turn, uh, but that can't be launched until later. So, basically, the Union is going to try to hold tight. If they are threatened, they'll probably pull back, um, and the Confederates are going to want to at least try to lengthen the line and soften it up for a direct attack um, somewhere. So, we'll go ahead, we'll do the artillery phase, and um, start pulling some chits and see how this resolves. Also, at the beginning of every turn, um, we roll for a Robert E. Lee chip. So, on the um, in the event of rolling a one, um, he basically is able to be set aside. And then, whenever a division is activated, uh, Confederate, you can put that one aside and use him instead to activate any other division. So it enables the division to essentially move twice. Uh, so I pulled Rhodes. And just because of zones of control work and mandatory attacks and combined attacks, um, Rhodes and Johnson are essentially done on Culp's Hill. Um, it, it would it'd be near suicidal for them to launch attacks. So I pulled Rhodes' chit and um, was deciding what other division to activate of the Confederates. Um, so it's kind of a torn strategy. Um, part of the Confederate attacks... Um, I'm almost envisioning a debate between Longstreet and Lee here. I feel like Longstreet would argue to swing further to the south, as he did, uh, seize these objective points. Um, it would take longer. It would take several turns. Um, because with Hood activated, I would be able to draw the Hood one again, and they'd at least be able to get to the Peach Orchard and threaten the flank. And it may draw Union forces away from... Uh, Cemetery Ridge, but knowing Lee's prerogative and what he wants, he, I don't think he would bypass the First Corps as it um, is stationed here. Um, these victory points 
are important. They could be worth anywhere from one to three um, by the end of the game, but he, he would want to attack the Union line, especially aiming for down here. I don't think he would want to swing to the south and potentially waste any more time because there's only five turns um, for him to secure victory. Uh, an automatic victory at least, and then we'll have to roll for those additional ones. But Lee would much rather break the Union Army here and now as opposed to flank. So I brought Hood over uh, to the west of the First Corps, and hopefully with the chit draws, the Confederates are going to uh, swarm the First Corps and destroy it, um, thereby opening up the southern flank uh, to an attack uh, later um, in the afternoon. First, I just wanted to show that uh, Nichols' brigade of Johnson's division moved up and seized uh, the heights of Culp's Hill. Um, not that that has major implications because there's nothing backing it up to sort of roll the flank, but in terms of a victory uh, hex, they did seize Culp's Hill. Uh, next came uh, Pender, um, moved him up behind Heath, uh, just in support for the Third Corps. Uh, but the big um, pull here was uh, McClaws. Um, so he wind up moving south, and now that they have um, uh, basically the first corps surrounded, Paul could slip out um, if under attack, but the real, we've got uh, Double Day's division, we've got Stone and uh, the Vermont, and they're surrounded. So the Confederates are going to play their combat shit, and uh, they're going to launch uh, some flank attacks I'll have to figure out the combined and mandatory attacks here. Um, the Union does have uh, a bit of artillery. I did save back the First Corps' um, artillery marker because the Union's in command of uh, Cemetery Hill. But um, this could, depending on the result of this battle, could definitely put the Union in um, up to a breaking point. Somehow the First Corps survives. Uh, they did take... Um, a couple casualties. Uh, Paul, Paul did survive, or survive, didn't have to fall back. And then uh, the Stone Brigade was destroyed, but the Vermont held on, uh, rolled uh, a one, which is an automatic success no matter the modifiers. So even if you do have uh, a large flank attack, um, you still have a one out of six chance of um, surviving, or, or permanently, or not permanently, but... Um, taking a step loss. And that's what happened. Uh, McClaws, one of the, his brigades, was destroyed, uh, and then Hood had to fall back. So really, the Confederates came um, uh, out behind um, in terms of victory points. Now, the problem is the First Corps is still alive and well. I don't know if that, if the Union will feel comfortable off, um, launching the Second Corps off of Cemetery Hill to slam into McClaws. Uh, division here, uh, or if they just want to extricate the first back. So, um, Union is still hanging on, and um, things very much hang in the balance. The first corps was able to extricate itself and fall back um, over to the Weikert farm, uh, and then Hood because they were already the south. When their chit was pulled, they moved and uh, seized the peach orchards. It did deprive um, another objective. We'll see if they continue swinging along. I know I was talking earlier about how Lee and Longstreet would have debated, but considering that the uh, first court did escape destruction, it might as well they might as well move down and then perhaps they can move more eastward um, because now the first court can cover. It just depends on how much more. They only have a couple turns. It may be worth swinging um, Hood's division down uh, through the wheat field and then a little round top. I don't know if he'll necessarily be able to participate in combat, um, but th at this point, I'll have to make the decision um, eventually. But uh, Heath and Anderson and Pender, not very active, uh, sort of lining thing, um, straightening out a line here. 
but the uh, the U.S. forces are definitely going to go on the offensive here. It's kind of risky with um, uh, the Sixth Corps, but uh, with a flank attack against, um, I think it's the flank. Actually, no, I don't think they get a flank attack because of the the higher elevation. But it's worth trying to um, push Nichols' brigade um, off of Culp's Hill. So we'll go ahead and conduct that combat. And uh, see, we've got a couple more uh, chits to pull, and then we'll move on to the late morning, um, which is turn 13 on uh, July 3rd. Not surprisingly, with the Union being able to bring 5 to 1 odds, uh, Nichols' uh, brigade was pushed off of Culp's Hill, and then um, of Crawford's division, uh, Fisher and McCandles uh, took the place. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if the Confederates should just withdraw. They run the risk of, since this is open, any further, um, they potentially be encircled. They may want to fall back to Benner's Hill. I mean, really, Gordon's pretty um, isolated here, too. It'd only take two different activations to swing around. And um, they wouldn't get the flank attack, though, just because it's um, on a hill. But anyway, we've got uh, just a couple chits left. And then the Confederates are going to have to make big decisions about whether or not it's worth to swing south or should, if they should just hit uh, Cemetery Ridge um, midday. I think early afternoon is the earliest um, we can use the Long Street Chit um, to activate the three, any three uh, formations. There's also a rule about um, basically putting together a grand battery um, where certain uh, Confederate artillery chits can be uh, used on the attack. High drama here on the fields of Gettysburg. Um, late morning of July 3rd, so the second turn of the day, turn uh, out of five. At the beginning of the turn, when we were doing the artillery um, chit assignment, Robert E. Lee rolled a one um, using that special command marker. And so later in the turn, when Rhodes was activated, um, basically discarded that, and Lee activated Hood uh, to swing south uh, and seize uh, the wheat field. Kind of splitting the first core up, but I think at this point it's worth trying to nab those. Um, basically trying to grab the wheat field and then pivot that way. Maybe not go all the way to the round top because they don't have the forces to really threaten. That'd be a waste of time to swing that south. But it, with the double activation with Hood, with the Robert E. Lee, they could afford to take the wheat field. However, there is a Union chit um, that came into play uh, on July 2nd, but was never used, which is this Warren chit, uh, who historically was the signal, um, he's a brigadier general, signal officer on top of a uh, little round top who saw the encroaching first corps um, during the second um, day's battle and was able to pull up reinforcements to uh, shore up the defenses here. In game purposes, that means any stack that is within six hexes of Little Round Top can interrupt the current Confederate activation. So effectively pull the first core back from the Vikert farm and deploy it into the wheat field. Hood continue to um, be activated as normal and instead of shying away from the fight, they're coming right uh, for the wheat field um, for a pretty even uh, battle here. So high drama here in the south. Um, depending on how this goes, this could jeopardize any potential attack by the um, Confederates going forward. Because also last turn I had moved Pickett in um, as kind of a shield against McClaws to prevent uh, the first core and potentially uh, the second core from launching a, a pincer. Or not a pincer, but a flank attack. Anyway, um, so we'll go ahead and resolve the combat here and uh, see where the Confederacy stands and what their offensive options are after that. The Union holds the wheat field, uh, no casualties, and uh, the only casualty from the Confederates were, uh, was Law's brigade was destroyed. Um, so now the Confederates are outnumbered really the first core moving here was kind of a block so i don't know if they're going to be able to pull back 
And even if they pull back, I don't know if they'll be able to contribute. Really, I mean, the Confederates are, they're running out of options. Um, they're thin on the ground. The Union's not competent enough. They don't want to risk it to leave and then get into a, a series of contests where, you know, there's a 50% chance that they'll take casualties um, because they're still lagging behind in the victory points. So they have 33, but they need 47. So there's still 14. So the odds of them launching a general offensive and getting 14 casualties, essentially, that's it's too high uh, of a risk because currently the... Um, The Confederates have 34 of the 30 or 41 that they need. So they were really hoping to pick at the margins here. They're hoping to destroy the first core here, and then that would open up an attack here. Uh, when that didn't happen, they thought they'd swing south and deprive the Union of these victory hexes here. But again, the first core was able to fall back. Um, the first core has really been the bane of the Army of uh, Northern Virginia uh, at Gettysburg. Um, so the, they've got one, the Confederates got one full strength division, that's Pickett, with Armistead, Garnett, and Kemper. McClaws is still pretty strong. Uh, Hood is slowly being depleted, but again, they're engaged. And then in the center with the Third Corps, uh, Anderson is um, semi-depleted. Pender is on the last ropes. Uh, four brigades are still there, but three of those are de um, depleted. And then Heath is actually all up to snuff. Archer, Davis, and uh, Pettigrew. And then, of course, as we talked about earlier, um, well, early, basically the second corps is uh, in tatters. So, again, at some point, maybe want to pull them off of Culp's Hill. So even if the Confederate attack comes, um, I just don't know where it's going to strike yet. But we'll keep pulling chits, um, and we'll, it'll probably be pretty conservative for the early after, or the late morning, and we'll see where the early afternoon takes us. Down by the wheat field, the First Corps launched a counterattack. It was ineffective. Um, I think the Vermont Brigade um, launched itself against one of the brigades of Hood. Paul wasn't uh, forced to do a mandatory attack. Um, elsewhere, they redeployed. Uh, they pulled the Sixth Corps back at, into the center. Um, Culp's Hill is pretty well defended now. Um, Rhodes and Johnson have run out of gas. And as you can see, Rhodes and Johnson, um, or at least Johnson pulled back, Rhodes will do the same. Um, it's pretty static the rest of the turn, almost. Um, Pickett put its, uh, his division in line with McClaws. Up here, uh, Hood pressed, um, and, and for the Confederate combat chit, uh, Hood pressed, uh, but Benning took a casualty, uh, and then there was another, um, brigade that was lost. Um, so effectively, against the First Corps, Hood's division is spent. Um, I don't know how how wise it would be for them to continue pressing on. Really, when we started the day, July 3rd, um, I thought the Confederates were in a much stronger position just because of the razor thin um, margin that the Union had to operate on in terms of units that they could lose. But currently we stand at the Union having 35 points of the requisite 47, so they're just 12 shy and the um, Confederates, they're, they have 34, so they are seven shy. Um, and that's going to make a difference here because the Confederates, they're running out of options. Um, I think as Lee faced historically, he's going to have to, I mean, the next turn is early afternoon. That's when Pickett's charge is essentially available. He's going to have to try something because it's, it's really the only option. I almost feel like Lee uh, on that day that, um, again, it, it played out in a truncated version. Um, you know, this struggle is happening on the on this third day as opposed to the second day. But the narrative has been largely the same. 
they've inflicted a lot of casualties on the Union, but they're just, they're not quite there in terms of that automatic victory. Now what they, the Confederates could do is fall back on the defensive, um, take up positions, maybe along Seminary Ridge, um, and then the Peach Orchard, hold on to these two victory, um, but then the, then when it comes time to rolling, um, the Union will be able to get points for Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, Little Round Top, and um, the Wheat Field. And at that point, that's minimally five. That's if they only roll uh, ones and twos. Um, so I, that's not really, that's not acceptable to the Confederates. They're not, they're not gonna pull back now. Um, so just like we did historically, we're gonna do the big shebang. Early afternoon, turn 14, July 3rd of 1863. Um, we'll be using um, the Longstreet Chit to be able to activate three um, corps or three divisions. I don't think Hood is gonna take part in it. Uh, we may just have to pull up, um, I think, Heath may be a part of it. Um, well, I'll go through the logistics, but I think it's it's clear that um, Lee's got to do something drastic here to break the Union line. Okay, early afternoon, July third. The um, all three core artillery is uh, are available for use uh, for the Confederates. We did the normal artillery pull. The Union just have a wealth of artillery, a bunch of reserves. Um, they were able to pull Pickett and Anderson. Um, so the three formations that are gonna be activated with the uh, Longstreet Chit, and that also means that they will be, uh, they won't be able to be used um, for the rest of um, the turn but they do get plus one to their activations it's going to be heath mccaws and uh pickett um heath is going to march up uh, maybe back or in front doesn't really matter if they can uh well depending on their their die roll actually it's kind of risky because what we're going to try to do is get heath to march and get to um, attack maybe these two points and then McClaws will swing in and hit Gibbon. So basically I want Heath to Hayes and Caldwell's um, divisions along the crest of uh, Cemetery Ridge. I want McClaws to come down and hit Gibbon and then Pickett's going to hit um, Will Caldwell and Gibbon here as well. Maybe even hit the tail end um, of the Ninth Corps. So that is um, their plan for, I don't know if history would know, I call this Pickett's Charge, but their last ditch effort to inflict Union casualties to, to bring about an automatic victory because it's not looking good for them if they go to um, the objective-based victory. So we'll go ahead and roll some dice and uh, we'll see how um, this uh, explosive charge, um, how it works and uh, how the battle ends. And we come to it. All the brigades were able to close and we will just go one by one down the line. Um, Cause that's how, in terms of the combined attacks and what's allowed, they each basically have to go down the line. So I guess we'll just roll this out live um, to see how it goes. So we'll start with trying to think if it's advantageous to pick the line of attacks because if we can breach and breach then we can make sure well yeah we'll do that so first we will do all right so we'll do McClaw versus Gibbon so it's a two versus a three, a three because of the, the hex height there. So it's a one to two attack. Um, so we'll go ahead and bring in one of the artillery. So the McClaws will bring that, but then the Union's gonna also up and bring 
of their reserve artillery. So it still is a one to two attack. So we'll go ahead to roll to see if Gibbon survives. It's a four, you minus one if it's a one to two. So it becomes a three, Gibbon does survive. So let's see if McClaw survives. They roll a one, they do as well. So that one's been taken care of. Those artillery chits have been spent. So that didn't quite work to cut it off. So we'll just go ahead and uh, continue down the line here. Uh, we've got the Irish Brigade defending against Armistids. Um, this is a two to one. Um, and they're gonna want to bring in an artillery to make it uh, three to two because the um, Union is also gonna bring an artillery. So basically uh, three versus three. So this is also uh, just a one-to-one -one, uh, straight wash. So let's roll for the Irish. They roll four, which means that they pass. And then Armistead is rolling, he rolls a five, which is a step loss. So that's one and he falls back. And then the Union gains uh, one point, which brings him up to 36. Now we're gonna do Kemper and Garnett versus Harrow. So that's gonna be four versus two. And that is a, well, four versus three actually. So even if they committed an artillery to make it five, it wouldn't matter. So they're not gonna commit any artillery. Um, so this is basically just a straight one-to-one. -one. So let's see if Harrow's brigade falls back. Roll three, uh, which they stand. Next, we'll roll for Kemper, which is a two. Uh, so they stand, and then uh, Garnett is a two. So they remain locked there. So we've taken care of these attacks. Uh, so we'll go Barksdale and Kershaw versus Hall. So if they brought in artillery, it would make it four to two, so it's two to one. So that's worth doing. So that, would, that forces um, the Union to come in artillery as well. So a lot of times the artillery will cancel each other out. So this just be, this will still become uh, a one-to-one -one, because it's four versus three. So that's just a one-to-one. -one. Let's see if Hall survives. One, it's an automatic success. Barksdale's a five, so basically they only need a six, or they would need a six to take a step loss. Four, they are in good shape and then we've got Kershaw roll of three in their good shape so actually the Confederates aren't budging the Union line at all but they're not taking terrible casualties all right let's do uh, Davis and Archer um, so that is four versus three altogether so if they even brought it to five it wouldn't matter so that they're not going to commit artillery so this is just a straight one-to-one -one as well. So we always roll for the defender first. So we'll roll for Brooks and Zook. One, that's a pass for Brooks, or just Brook. And Zook is a five, which is actually a, uh, a loss. So Zook uh, is destroyed, and then the Confederates gain a point, uh, but Brook rem remains in place. Then here, we've got Pettigrew, three versus a two. So they are gonna um, commit an artillery and they are actually out of artillery um, to be used. So the Union won't commit any. So we'll see if Carol survives. A six, which means uh, Carol is destroyed. And the Confederates gain a point, which also brings up about 36. And then we'll roll for Pettigrew. Pettigrew's a one, so it's an automatic success. And we'll go ahead and we will move Pettigrew. Well, I don't know if we want to move him up there necessarily, because he won't be able to move. Um, he may be able to attack again. So actually, we are just going to move him up. He's going to breach Cemetery. Uh, Cemetery Ridge. So actually not as conclusive uh, as uh, I thought it would necessarily be. 
but we're gonna go ahead and uh, draw some chits and essentially if the Confederates can draw one chit again, then they, they can attack again, um, which would bode, bode well, um, especially for inflicting casualties here. So we'll go ahead and uh, see what they can do. All right, in response to Pettigrew breaching the line, the, um, the Sixth Corps moved up two brigades to help plug the hole for the Union wind up just taking casualties um, because of the, uh, the combined attacks. Um, elsewhere, uh, the First Corps, continuing their brilliant wind streak, uh, pushed back uh, Robertson's brigade, effectively um, destroying Hood's division. I mean, they've got two steps left, but that's not much. Um, so they did launch, the Union did launch their one counterattack. Um, the rest of these uh, didn't necessitate mandatory attacks since they were on higher elevation. Uh, but then the Confederates pulled the Anderson shit, which they are moving three steps into um, help support this breach here. Um, and they are going to launch their, um, their full combat because Pender's out, he doesn't want to, Confederates don't want to bring in um, Hone here. And again, north of Culp's Hill, that's just done. And essentially, Hood spent here. So their main effort is Pickett, Claus, Heath, and Anderson um, striking at the Union line again. We'll go ahead and uh, resolve these combats and see where we stand. Uh, it currently stands the Union's got 36 out of 47 that they need, and the Confederates currently have uh, 37 out of the 41. So they only really need four. So they are on the brink of breaking the Union. The Union mostly held, um, where did they take losses? I think there was a brigade here that got pushed back. Um, Brooks is isolated on the western slope of Cemetery Hill, but Union got incredibly lucky. Um, pushback Pettigrew, um, pushback, I think it was, it was Archer and Davis, uh, Pickett, um, each of them were thrown back. McClaws had a little more uh, success here, being able to breach uh, and push on. That was the combat for um, uh, early afternoon. Uh, we still have a handful of chits to pull. Um, I, I think it's going to be pretty static, though. Uh, we'll have to continue um, the combat into late afternoon. Um, McClaws is going to have a hard time extricating himself. Wilford is going to have to fall back um, just because they can't, at the end of an operational turn, you can't remain um, adjacent to units on higher ground. That's clear. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's inconclusive right now the points the confederates need two points they have 38 or three points um 38 out of the 41 that they need and the confederate or in the union has um 42 out of the 47 so it's become a three point uh versus five point game so it, it really is coming down to the wire here so let's pull some shits and um see how it ends uh so basically during the retreat phase, uh, Wolford had to fall back, um, and then most of Anderson's, uh, the two brigades he had forward had to fall back as well, uh, leaving Barksdale trapped. Um, yeah, so Pickett Charge has melted away. It's going to be hard. They won't be able to move the three up again uh, and attack. They'll have to move them up piecemeal, and then at any point the, the Union will be able to potentially counter... Um, so it's just really close. Um, we have two turns left. The Confederates just have to push. They have to push it over. They need three points, so they, they just need something. Um, they could potentially get, uh, eliminate, um, Brooke here for one. Um, and their options are just, they're dwindling. Um, but they still gotta try, um. We'll do the artillery, we'll throw the chits in the cup, and uh, we'll see what happens. Not only did Robert E. Lee get his special uh, chit because he rolled uh, a one, so he'll be able to switch out um, 
is uh, any Confederate uh, marker uh, and actually another division. Um, the Confederates were lucky and they got Heath. So Heath is going to clo is closing again and is going to try to wipe out uh, Brooke. Um, but then Barksdale, with its strength, is going to try to hit Gibbon. Um, so hopefully with there, that'll get two more points. Um, that'll take it to 40, and then they'll just be one shy. So hopefully with the blowing open of the center of Cemetery Ridge here, um, they'll be able to uh, to win. And then they're uh, going to be banking on Robert E. Lee being able to activate and fight again uh, just to pick off that, that last point there. Um, so it's coming down to the wire here. So let's go ahead and, and roll this here. Um, we are going to do... So Barksdale can't participate here just because of the rules of combined attack. If you participate in a combined attack, you can't do that if um, there are any other enemies in your zone of control. So let's do the easy one here first. We have three, four... Uh, versus two because of the hills, uh, the hill. Uh, so it's two to one, but of course, uh, the Union's just got a wealth of uh, artillery, so they'll have a one, uh, which will it, turn it to three, uh, to four, uh, so that it really will just be a one to one. So let's see if Brooke survives. There's a six, and Brooke does not survive. That's automatic. That's destroyed and so the confederates gain one there so they have to go down the line and see if um heath's division how they fare Pettigrew, the one passes davis uh, is a four passes and then finally we've got archer which is a four uh which is over its three so that actually fails so uh, Archer is destroyed and the Union gains a point, so they are now up to 43. So they are four points shy. And uh, Davis, Pedro, they are going to come up onto Cemetery uh, Ridge. Barksdale and Gibbon. Uh, this is a one to one. Let's see if Gibbon, well, actually, no. Um, Gibbon is going to throw in oh, Kim McClaw. Claw's going to throw in artillery to make it a three because um, if they didn't, then the Union would have thrown in theirs. So now it is a one to one after artillery's been committed. The Philadelphia Brigade it was a six. Falls back uh, the difference uh, between the TER and the die roll. So that would be three. One, two, three. Let's see, Sparksdale. He rolls a three, so he passes, and he will go ahead and move forward. The Confederates are one point away from winning. They just need to inflict one more loss. And the Union needs to inflict um, four losses. It's tight. Might as well play this out, so let's see what the next chit is. It is Anderson. Does Anderson even want to... Already done their activation, but if Robert E. If he activates Robert E. Lee, be his best bet to try to hit um, Willard. Could even try to hit Newton. He wouldn't be on a hill. It's a little too strong. We will go ahead. Yeah, we'll bring up Anderson. Anderson, actually, yeah, so, so essentially with the chit, you can replace, not play Anderson, but then also then just play Anderson. So it'll, it allows you to attack with the chit that you pulled or it allows you to discard it and, and activate any division. So we'll, we'll do Anderson anyway. So let's roll 
He has a four, which means he can move six. One, two, three. One, two, three. So he has three against a three there. And Anderson will bring in artillery to make it four. Um, and the Union won't commit theirs because it won't make a difference. Um, so we're really doing one-to-one. -one. So there's a 50% chance that the Union loses here. And they rolled a three, which means uh, Willard survives. Um, now we're going to see if Wilcox is a five. He's obliterated. So the Union gains a point there. And then right is a four, so he passes. So that is all the opportunities that the Confederates have to attack this turn. Um, they are just one point away, and the Union is now um, three points away. So, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, keep pulling the rest of the chits. Um, and see what the Union can come up with. And that is actually it. The Confederates have wound up uh, pulling out a victory here. What happened is um, Pickett was able to move. There was no more combat for the Confederates left this turn, but they were able to pour a couple brigades in to um, sort of um, have a greater foothold on their breach and Cemetery Ridge. But the Union, knowing that um, they have many more isolated brigades, um, and it'll be easy for the Confederates to pick uh, a brigade to pick off to get that final victory point, they decided to um, take the initiative and launch the attack. Uh, there was a, I think it was a two to one, Let's see, it was six, seven. Yeah, the three to one attack against uh, Armistead. He wound up uh, surviving because with a three to one, it's only uh, adds two to the die, and they rolled a he rolled a two. Um, that didn't pan out, but everyone survived there, so it got risky. And then we went down here. Actually, it was decided um, on the almost the the quiet uh, sector. Um, Crawford. Uh, division swung off of Culp's Hill in the hit roads, inflicted a casualty, but uh, Crawford wound up rolling a six, and that was the last uh, point there. Um, he's also attempting to have the first corps um, attack Hood, but Hood fell back. So really the final pointage um, is 41 to 35. And the only reason, uh, that doesn't seem that like that big of a discrepancy, but the Confederates had those delay uh, victory points. So the automatic victory is making is 40 plus any delay victory points. Essentially, you're supposed to be able to um, do more with less, and that's what the Confederates were able uh, to do. Uh, but narratively, I mean, it makes sense here after um, just a recap of uh, the three days. Um, some uh, pretty brutal fighting on McPherson's Ridge. Uh, the First Corps um, giving um, the first divisions coming down the Chambers of Group Pike hell. Um, the First Corps is left exposed, just at, um, short of Seminary Ridge. Um, they escape destruction, they fall back, and the Union is able to entrench early in the day. Um, the Confederate line came up. Uh, remember that um, a couple of divisions of Longstreet's Corps didn't come up till later in the day. Uh, they did launch a sort of a hasty attack against Cemetery Ridge that was pushed back. And at the beginning of July 3rd, um, elements of uh, Hood's division tried to swing north. There was some bitter fighting around the wheat field. And then uh, Robert E. Lee went broke and just launched uh, what would be uh, Pickett, uh, McClaw, and um, Heath's uh, charge against Cemetery Ridge. And as you can see, uh, they were able to breach it. Um, so with the breach in the center there, uh, and then the losses up in the north, um, that would be enough uh, narratively for the Union um, to withdraw and pull back. So um, even though 
obviously ended in a Confederate uh, victory. Uh, they were able to do a lot. Um, yeah, even though it ended with a Confederate victory, it still played out very much like uh, the history um, without being super scripted either. It was uh, pretty organic. Um, I was thinking about letting not letting Union go on the offensive and letting one more turn go by, but again, it, um, that margin of error was so thin for them, it made more sense for them to go on the offensive. So, well, that was my full playthrough for uh, Gettysburg uh, from Clash of Giants Civil War, uh, designed by Ted Racer and published by uh, GMT. So if you're still around, uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed um, uh, the third day or even the second and the first day. And um, we'll uh, catch you in the next one.